Hi, everyone. I really hope you guys are having a great week. Happy uh, Thursday, almost Friday. Uh, so I'm here joined by uh, faculty and some staff and also other um, adjunct professors and even some alumni from FIU who are joining us with the Global Forensics and Justice Center. We're doing the collaboration from the crime scene to the courtroom discussion panel. I really hope you guys enjoy this. So we have a few uh, housekeeping notes to keep in mind. Uh, we ask that you keep your mics muted at all times. The panel will last about an hour and this panel will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube uh, sometime later this week. If you have any questions about any um, programs or you're interested in the department, you can always contact the Global Forensics and Justice Center at forensics at fiu.edu. And any additional information and links will be added to the chat. There will also be a Q&A towards the end. We're gonna start with um, basically an introduction with our panelists. So if uh, Dr. Goldfarb can start with the her introduction. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having us here. It's quite an honor. I think I recognize a couple of also additional names from my legal psychology class. And so I'm Dr. Deborah Goldfarb. I'm one of five professors of our legal psychologist here at FIU. We study the intersection of law and psychology and think about how the two interact with each other. Um, in my former life before coming to FIU, I was an attorney. I graduated from the University of Michigan Law School. I worked in um, big law and then also clerked in the federal courts for a couple of years. I then returned to academia, got my PhD in psychology, and now I'm here at FIU in our legal psychology program. And it is a great pleasure to be on the panel with such wonderful and esteemed speakers. So thank you guys for having me. So Michael Cluster will be our second panelist. Uh, can you please do your introduction? Thank you. My office is right next to train tracks and I was waiting for the train to pass by because all you would have heard is more. Uh, so my name is Michael Kessler. I'm currently the forensics and public safety manager for the Denton Police Department, which is just north of Dallas and Fort Worth here in Texas. Um, I have roughly 20 years of experience in forensic sciences, mostly in law enforcement, but also about equal time doing intelligence work with the military. Uh, I'm actually a graduate of FIU. I have a professional science master's in forensic science from FIU. I'm also an adjunct instructor. I teach in that professional science master's program now as well. And since 2016, I've been very actively involved in the development of standards uh, for primarily crime scene investigation, but also um, for other scene type disciplines within the forensic sciences. Good evening, my name is Phyllis Cote. I'm a professor in the College of Law. I teach uh, criminal law, criminal, just, uh, criminal procedure, professional responsibility, but more importantly, I sit as a senior judge and um, as a prosecutor, heard cases and, and presented cases um, that utilize forensic evidence. So I've had the opportunity as a legal practitioner, both as a prosecutor, uh, presiding as a judge, and now as a professor, uh, teaching students in terms of, of, of criminal procedure and criminal practice uh, about issues as they relate to the courtroom. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Jerry Laporte, and I'm the, currently the Director of Research Innovation at the Global Forensic and Justice Center, which is a preeminent program at FIU. Uh, his, based on uh, just a little bit of my history. So I've been in the forensic sciences for uh, about 29 years. My first job going back to uh, 1993 when I worked in a medical examiner's office doing autopsies, going out to crime scenes and collecting evidence. Uh, I then worked in a toxicology lab laboratory just outside of Dallas, Texas. And, uh, and then uh, I worked as a forensic drug chemist at the Anne Arundel County Police Department in Maryland, uh, which is the county that's uh, Annapolis is within, and then at the Virginia Division of Forensic Sciences. And then in 2001, I started with the United States Secret Service. Uh, I worked at the Secret Service for nine years, and I finished there as the, uh, the Chief Research Forensic Chemist. Uh, and then in 2009, I went over to the Department of Justice, uh, and I worked as the Director of the Office of Investigative and Forensic Sciences at the National Institute of Justice which is the research and development arm of the United States Department of Justice. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Lothridge, and I'm the director of the Global Forensic Justice Program at Florida International University. I have 37 years of experience in forensic science. I ran the crime lab in Pinellas County for several years and then joined a nonprofit called the National Forensic Science Technology Center, which started in 1995 as O.J. Simpson was driving his Bronco down the five in California. Uh, in 2018, the nonprofit NFSTC joined FIU and became part of the Global Forensic Justice Center. Um, we're interested in running programs that are cross-cutting across all the colleges and departments at FIU, and we support a lot of different federal and state and local agencies. Look forward to speaking to you tonight. All right, awesome. So like I mentioned before, thank you for doing this collaboration and for joining us with this event. The first question that I want to basically ask, and it can go in any order, um, why is it important that we start to unsilo forensic science in the criminal justice system? So I, I don't mind starting in terms of an answer to that question, because I think I'm looking at it from both a trial practitioner standpoint and a, a judge who has presided over these cases, it becomes really obvious why it's necessary that we must coordinate. I mean, if nothing else, the fact that people who are not guilty um, may be convicted if information is not shared properly becomes one of the chief reasons, I think, why it's so important, uh, both as lawyers, practitioners, and, and people who are presenting that evidence uh, work together in terms of making sure that the integrity of the system is not compromised by standards that, that really lack the sufficiency to, to really be properly in court. So I, I, I think when we think about those things, both as a prosecutor who had a responsibility to provide certain information and to oversee that kind of information, and as a judge who had that opportunity to preside over it, it becomes of, of utmost importance um, that we not have our silos in terms of keeping that information so that the truth is not known. Because after all, at the end of the day, the prosecutor and the judge should be in search of the truth more than anyone else in that courtroom. And to follow on for our several years of starting up the nonprofit, that was the exact reason we were there. So the, the people would have the full confidence in the independent nature of forensic science. We truly believe that a well-trained trier of fact using proper scientific information, not things that they've gleaned off TV or other places, um, are a much better service to the public. And we have seen this over the time that we started the nonprofit in 1995. We did it because the forensic science community was not ready to handle the scrutiny that it was about to befall it, right? So this predates any of your forensic edutainment, as I like to call it. The 200 hours a week, you can watch a TV show with some forensic science in it. And they get about 30% of it right because real forensic science is boring, but it's very important. And if we look at the silos, we kept silos because we weren't comfortable with the science. And the science tells you the true facts. It's how the, the defense attorneys and the prosecutors and the judges interpret that information and the jury is pre presented that information. So it's been our goal for the last 30 years to make sure that everybody had the true information. And it's unfortunate that people look at TV shows and know that in 45 minutes without commercials and no budget constraints and no other rules, they get answers that are probably not what you're really gonna get in real life because it's unlikely that Mike Kessler is wearing an Armani suit right now at the crime scene uh, department. So that I, I totally agree with what Phyllis said. So. And I'll just add to what the, what the judge and Kevin just said. And so one of the things that I see is that there just needs to be more transparency about real life forensic science. So there, forensic science, um, I don't wanna break the news to everyone, but it has, it has a lot of limitations. And if we're not communicating that properly to whether it's the prosecutor, the defense, uh, the courts, the judges, you know, then, then that can be that, that can be a, a travesty on the system because they may perceive um, 
our findings to be a lot more than they truly are. So and I, I don't want to go into sort of, you know, too many details, but I'll just kind of mention this idea of microscopic hair testing, which goes back several years. But um, so microscopic hair analysis uh, was something that was done for many years in the 80s and 90s. And um, I, I just don't think that it was clear that it was made clear by a lot of those examiners at the time about what the limitations were at the time. Um, so, so that's one of the things that I see is just really creating more transparency uh, and then kind of going off what Kevin said is that this is not television forensics. Um, it, it has, uh, it, it doesn't, I, I've testified, I think a hundred and a little over 120 times now in my career. And I can tell you that no one case that I've ever been involved with has ever been made just based on one thing. It's a jigsaw puzzle, if you will. So we're just one piece of that puzzle and a forensic method or a forensic discipline can be one of other jigsaw, jigsaw pieces in that puzzle too. I'll piggyback on what Jerry said, um, you know, kind of speaking to overstating results, right? Um, I, I obviously wasn't there when people started overstating their results, specifically with friction ridge or fingerprint type evidence, right? A lot of times, uh, historically, examiners would represent that they were able to match from this donor, right? This suspect is the only person to the exclusion of all others that it came from, you know, this one person. Um, that very legal type language to the exclusion of all others, uh, I'm going to suspect never came out of a fingerprint examiner's mouth until it was posed to them by a prosecutor, right? Trying to use science, hopefully in the right way, but again, really wanting that weight behind it. Some of the, you know, DNA has weight behind it. We're able to put a statistic to it. And that's very, very helpful to the trier of fact, to the jury, or even the judge who do not have the, the level of science understanding um, that a forensic science professional does. And we also don't have that legal understanding that they do. That's why we need to work so closely together. Um, and interestingly enough, there's even proposed rule changes to rule 702 um, that I just learned about the other day to really address those overstatements. Um, and very specifically, they happen in the, um, the impression type discipline. So firearms examination, uh, friction ridge skin. And those are also, interestingly, the type of disciplines that have come more out of law enforcement people using a little bit of science rather than research scientists bringing forward like DNA bringing forward very good science that's able to support um, and making sure that we strike that right balance and really understanding the limitations of what we have. Um, you know, there's plenty of innocence project type cases and things of that nature where forensic science was used. And it's, uh, again, a likely from overstatement or, you know, some clearly ethical and forensic fraud type things. Um, but there, there's that balance that we need to strike. And the only way that we can do that is by unsiloing and partnering together to make sure that we're using forensic science as a tool in the process and not using it to, to try to hold up things that otherwise shouldn't be. I will say one, well, I'll say one, two things actually. First is, right, research shows that juries love forensic science, right? They love um, a confession. Those of you who are in my class remember this, right? They love a confession. <laughs> they love an eyewitness less than a confession. They love confession more, but they love forensic science. And so we do have to be very careful with it because Jerry's absolutely right. It's one piece and that's how we all view it, right? It's just one piece of the puzzle, but we know juries love that piece and they tend to align forensic science, right, with the prosecution. And so I would think when we're thinking about that siloing, I think that that's probably a goal for both the legal system and the forensic science community to help people see that forensic science can and does straddle both sides, right? Um, similar to all justice, right? Thinking both directions, both prosecution and defense, um, because I know a large perception continues to be that forensic scientists work solely for the prosecution. Yeah, I can just add though, I think it's the love affair that's created the problem. You know, this love affair of the prosecutor and the forensic scientist, or the, at least forensic evidence. And, and, and one of the inquiries that, that, that has to be made every single time now in trials is the CSI effect. And people expect, you know, you understand this is not going to wrap up in 45 minutes. You understand I can't pick up a simple hair. And, and 
good prosecutors have to spend a fair amount of time distinguishing themselves from the fantasy of, of forensic evidence and the reality of forensic evidence. And I think someone else alluded to it, but I think prosecutors created this when they married it too closely without it being properly uh, based in science. I mean, I'm old enough that I was back there with those original DNA cases and um, and and dealing with those issues and good and good forensic uh, scientists or good officers who are giving you those that fingerprint evidence would not be as emphatic as prosecutors would want them and and you would you either have to decide as a prosecutor am I going to live with that and simply present it as it is because even with the percentages it was fine but people would want to talk about beyond all doubt I'm like that's not a standard so they would create these 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 um, hurdles that didn't have to exist in order to be successful. And it created these issues in terms of the, the fallacy of, 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 of what real uh, forensic evidence is, it is and what it's not. And, and I'll just add a real simple example onto what everybody has said here, which I, I, I agree 100% with is that, um, so we use certain words in our uh, Vocabulary, I'll say in forensic sciences, we'll use words like match, consistent with, similar to. So when, when a forensic scientist says those words, that means they're, what it means is they can't say two things are the same, right? So we would use the same word if, if we truly could find something mean the same. So we find other words like match them, similar to, consistent with. And then what happens is those words get taken out of context if we really don't explain all of that. So if I'm testifying in a trial and I say that um, these two items were consistent with each other, the prosecutor may say in their, their final, you know, their closing argument, well, you heard my experts say that those two are the same as each other. So I, it, and I'm not saying this is intentional in any way, but if there's a, you know, it, as I've got this slide that I do in this presentation and I show, you know, one person speaking Chinese and another person speaking English and I have, that's the forensic scientist and that's the lawyer. So our language just sometimes doesn't marry up. And to add to that, over the years, we've gotten as forensic scientists much better at responding to both sides, asking questions we know are not correct, and using demonstration to show what we mean by comparable or a match. So I did a lot of work in fire debris analysis and words are very difficult to explain what a gasoline pattern looks like versus a pyrolysis pattern of just plastic. But if you show everyone and you educate, which is our job to take very complex things and make them simple and communicate those to everyone, then you eliminate some of the bias that people can take with words and make them play for themselves. Because if it's clearly different, people can see that it's clearly different. And that's what you have to hope for when the jury's back deliberating is they got the understanding of what the true value of our small piece of the process was. So really great answers from everyone. I can definitely agree that a lot of things that go in the courtroom specifically with forensics can be taken out of context. And it's a really good idea to kind of have all departments kind of share this um, understanding of how it can be misinterpreted, especially in the public. Like Dr. Golfar mentioned how we love when juries or we love it when we have forensic evidence or confessions, especially in, in today's climate, it's super um, enticing. Uh, the next question that I have for you is, we all know what has gone, gone wrong. So what can we do better going forward? Well, I don't. <laughs> I don't mind starting off again. I I, I don't necessarily have to. Um, Kevin, were you going to go? You can go. I'll follow you. It's all so. Good. So I th I think what we can do better, and, and we've alluded to it an awful lot, is is simplify our language, make our language um, not only friendlier but a real. You know, you know, if it what is consistent with me, 
and explain that to the jury when you're talking about consistent with. And you talk to them about why identical is impossible, that anyone who tells you it's identical would not be telling the truth. And why is that? And what is it, that, you know, what does it mean when you say consistent? You know, can you quantify that? You know, what does that mean in terms of numbers? Can you, are you able to do that? And, and I think um, using language uh, or lay terms that would allow the jury to be able to identify the, the weight and effect of what's being said to them can be best. And I think judges go a long way in, in, in being able to do that if they stop attorneys who aren't. But, but I know as a judge, we, 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 we are always struggling with, I don't want to do that. I hated judges who did my case for me. I'm like, it's my case, judge, I need to back off. Um, so so as, as much as I want to say, I realize the value of that as a judge, I also realize that it's not that it's not my role um, to try the case for uh, the attorneys. But if we are looking for a search for the truth, um, I, I, I think you ha it is incumbent upon attorneys to uh, and, and judges to ensure that those things are, are, are happening. Now, confusion, of course, goes to the benefit of a criminal defense. So we I, I think it's unrealistic for us to, to expect those, that kind of clarification. But I think the ethical rules as it relates to judges and lawyers and prosecutors are clear um, in terms of the truth and being clear with the language and being ethical in terms of how they present that evidence can go a long way to the right. So, so one of the things we did, and we haven't talked about this, just so everybody knows the panel did not get it before the questions came out. So. I enjoyed what you said, Phyllis. I think it's really important. But one of the things we did several years ago is we developed something called Forensic Science Simplified. And it was an on-ramp for everyone. So there was a, a piece for judges, a piece for lawyers on both sides, the general public. And it went through every forensic topic and addressed those areas where we needed to make sure everybody had a common understanding that was not something they saw on CSI or NCIS or any of the other TV shows. And we truly believe that if we can train people appropriately, we don't give how to do a trial. We don't do trial practice training. And we've been, we've been asked by many defense attorneys to do that. And we, they were sadly disappointed when we gave them the real science and not exactly how to trip somebody up. But I think if you can give them the real training and the American Chemical Society, for example, has done a training on science for lawyers, which I think is an extremely good thing. They're independent. It was really for the people doing DUI and other cases, so they would understand gas chromatography and how to measure blood alcohol levels and all those kinds of things. But there's no reason we shouldn't do that for every forensic discipline, including the comparative sciences. I think you know the rap that the comparative sciences get are these people are freewheeling, there's no standards, there are, there's no research behind it, which is absolutely not true. And as we get further into technology, digital evidence will be your next one. You've already seen cases solved by smart devices, watches, phones, Fitbits, Alexas, whatever you want, you name it. That's gonna be a real challenge as we start bringing in technology mixed with traditional forensic science for people who don't necessarily understand that. So training to answer your question is the, I think the most important thing and that clear level of communication, apples to apples and oranges to oranges as far as the words go. Yeah, uh, and to the future lawyers in the room, I mean, one of the good things the law schools have been doing is bringing more science into the law schools, right? Hiring more PhDs, lucky for me, um, and other sort of scientists and don't back away from taking those classes. The very first witness that I, cross-examined on the stand was actually, ironically, a PhD psychologist. And I benefited from having had some statistical training and expertise, right? I would never go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her at that point or maybe any point, but having had that background definitely made me a better attorney in that moment. The other thing I will say that we need to start training people on is that imperfection is okay, <laughs> especially in science. I think people expect no error rates, nothing to go wrong. And maybe we set them up with the idea of beyond reasonable doubt that there is, if you've been in my class, you know I love this idea that there's a mismatch between scientific error and beyond reasonable doubt. I won't make you live through that tonight. But um, 
giving the idea that science doesn't have to be perfect or to be really good, um, right? And I have the saying, I always say that better is good. I stole it from President Obama. Um, but that as long as science is moving us forward, we can be okay with that and take you know solace in that fact. And that as forensic science improves, we can be okay that the science is getting better and that error before doesn't mean error now. It doesn't mean more error tomorrow. So I think we can start training more people on that idea. Um, we'll be in a better place scientifically across the boards. And I would say that, um, you know, I think I can say this, um, you know, sort of broadly is that forensic science has been improving for the past several years. I know Kevin's been around, you know, 35 plus years. I've been around 29 years and it, it's a lot different than it was. And it's better than it was. Uh, it's still not perfect. We still have, you know, we still have a long ways to go. Uh, but one thing I think that that I'm seeing more of, uh, and I know Mike Kessler understands this, is that uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, has what's a program called the Organization of Scientific Area Committees, or OSAC, and they work on standards. So I know Mike and I are part of those standards committees, but the one thing that, um, and actually through a grant that I'm working on with NIST, so one of my responsibilities is to put together what's called scientific and technical review panels, STRPs, to review standards. And on those STRPs, we have, um, in addition to three or four subject matter experts, we have a legal uh, person, a human factors or cognitive psychology type person, a, a statistician, and then a quality assurance type person that's not necessarily a subject matter expert in that area. And the one thing that I'm learning, I, I mean, I knew this, but the one thing that I just see, you know, time and time again is that when a, when a lawyer reads our standards, there are a lot of questions. They, they, they're, they're able to pick up on a lot of ambiguities in the words that we use. Um, and, and frankly, uh, lawyers are much better readers than scientists are. Um, so they're a lot more nitpicky about certain words. And I can tell you that it has been a tremendous help having, having legal representatives serve on those STRPs. In the past, we never had that in our standards. It was just a bunch of subject matter experts sitting, sitting around in a room. We'd use our own jargon. You know, we might use, we all use the word, you know, consistent with or matches and that all, that all meant the same, that was the same to all of us. But then when you get somebody else from the outside looking in, um, then they start bringing out these, these things that, that we never thought of in the past. So I, I think that's a huge improvement that's happening in the community right now is just more uh, active, I'll say active participation in standards and then the generation of new standards. I think too, um... Dr. Goldfarb kind of touched on it, um, and Gary talked about it a little bit as well, right? We need to be comfortable being uncomfortable as far as just because we've always done it this way does not mean that when we change that what we've done is wrong, right? Just like medicine, medicine has changed. Medicine is an applied science, just like forensics is. And through the way it's all law enforcement's fault, I see it. Uh, we're, we're horrible at taking little bits of science that we like and without data to support it, extrapolating it into something completely different. Um, and it goes for so many different things. Um, you know, fingerprints is kind of one of those and where it jumped from the, well, I've never seen two fingerprints that are exactly alike. So I can say that it's to the exclusion of all others. Um, you know, I've, uh, if you're familiar with the Sandra Bland case that happened down uh, in Houston, um, the pretext stops that happened, um, if you're familiar with that, right, the pretext stop being, I'm going to stop this vehicle because I want to stop gun crime. I want to stop drug crime. So it's a minor traffic infraction and I can then hunt for other things. It's changed the way that law enforcement has done traffic stops. And I would argue it's changed the way that law enforcement and the public interacts because every traffic stop is now accusatory. Every traffic stop has now got a different agenda other than us being part of the community. Um, so we've, we've done that with science in the forensic sciences, but we've also done it with data. Um, you know, pretext traffic stops comes out of uh, a study that was done in Kansas City in their very, very most violent places. Um, and they didn't even use it across the whole city and they used it very differently than law enforcement, again, has taken that little bit of empirical data and gone awry with it. Um, 
and it's just become the standard. So having folks in law enforcement, we're very much the, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we will do it. Um, and being able to be the change agents and realize that we need to, to move forward and we need to move past that. Again, it's not, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm always have been wrong. It's just accepting where you're at and realizing that there's new information, being able to make that change and grow and make our justice system better and stronger and our society safer through that. Like before, really great answers. I can definitely agree the fact that um, I think Cody said that we needed to basically kind of come up with um, communicate better and have like certain agreements with how we uh, use the terminologies. And then Kevin said training. Training is actually a really good idea of how we can work together, um, not only showing the legal side, but also um, showing the forensic side of you know, the, the criminal justice system. Uh, the next question is, so how does the legal system rely on forensic science for exonerations? Anyone can go. <laughs> Unless you have to take that, that's your, that's your area. We're gonna defer to you. I mean, you can take the girl out of the courtroom, but I'm gonna to defer to the judge every single time, judge. <laughs> So <laughs> <laughs> it's critical. It is absolutely critical in terms of the the legal system, depending upon the the ethical um, presentation of forensic evidence, especially in terms of exonerations. I mean, we're, we're seeing it all the time now when we look at um, pieces of evidence that weren't well, some of them you weren't even able to make, I think, guess, an evaluation years ago. The science has grown, and there's something to be said for the fact that the science continues to grow, continues to improve, and provides us with an opportunity to present that information and that evidence. And, and the legal system has, has met that so much so that we now have legal rules of procedure and ethical rules that says, prosecutor, if you get information that someone did not commit this crime, you have a duty to investigate. It's no longer possible to just, just look at this, to, to just ignore and say, well, the jury found them guilty. They've had an appeal. It's been done. And, and I think that that marrying of the legal duty to investigate the truth um, and the, the ability of forensic um, evidence and forensic science to provide us with improved, new and improved information becomes critical. Um, you know, we have that balanced justice product, uh, project at our law school. In fact, you know, Heather Gorman is my, my office neighbor and we, and we talk about it all the time in terms of, of evidence that becomes lost or, or hidden and, and, and the role of even, and, and we're seeing it more with prosecutors. Remember I told you, we now have a prosecutor innocence project that we work with in terms of Duval County. We have a conviction integrity project that our students are working with, with, with the Broward County um, State Attorney's Office. So prosecutors are taking seriously this duty um, to, to eke out the truth and to make sure that wrongful convictions are, are overturned because it's just the right thing to do. It doesn't matter whether the time period has passed. So I think the legal system in terms of relaxing those kind of artificial, you have 30 days, you have 60 days, it's been five years, um, is, is, is assisting in this search um, for the truth or this marrying of forensic evidence and, and the law. I think one of the things to think about, and, and Debbie said this before, technology moves us forward. If we look at the first DNA case of 1988 compared to a DNA case now, it's pretty scary. Jerry and I have been around a long time. And when we've looked at analyses done in the early, late 70s, early 80s, very different than they are now. They were state of the art at the time and the best they could do. But we do have new processes. Conviction integrity units are going to be very, very important because that keeps everybody honest. And we know that sometimes 
evidence doesn't get looked at. If we take cases such as genetic genealogy cases from 60 years ago, and we can identify the perpetrator using genetic genealogy, familial searching, advanced DNA technology, and we can get some resolution of the case for the, for the victims and their family, as well as the justice system, now we're not looking for somebody who may already be incarcerated, dead, whatever happened to them. And I think one of the things you, the group might be interested in is that we're releasing a podcast trailer next week over a case from Colorado where a Girl Scout was killed in 1963. And the person who did it, it went unsolved up until they ran genetic genealogy on this. And so there's, I think it's a really, really interesting um, case. But for me, going back and talking to everybody, it was really because they kept the evidence from 1963. Now let's think about that. State of the art in 1963 was not state of the art now. We were able to run DNA profiling on the stains left in a sleeping bag to match that. So that's the same thing when we go back and look at cases where somebody said, we did the best we could in 1988, or we did the best we could in 2011 to now. Uh, the Department of Justice in the mid 2000s asked us to develop a project called Principles of Forensic DNA for Officers of the Court. And it was for everybody. And it was an online learning. We worked with the ABA. It was really to take that first instance in England where DNA typing was used to move it forward to talk about what can you and can you not do and what might be the future for DNA testing. And so projects like that funded by the federal government delivered by our colleagues at FIU are really, really important. And I think that's the way we look at making sure the best use of forensic science removes the bias or other things that happen in some of these cases. So, so I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate science and forensic science for really giving us what we know about wrongful convictions now. So DNA exonerations have, they, they provided everybody with scientific proof that the individual that was incarcerated for 25, 30 years was not the one that did it. And so there were, I know there was kind of the attitude in the past was, well, you know, everybody in prison says that, you know, they're, they're innocent, right? So that, that was kind of the attitude, but we never really had sort of that strong science to show, to prove, right? That, that that person was actually telling the truth and that they, in some cases were able to identify the true perpetrator of the crime. So I think in my view, and I've written a paper on this, and I actually managed a program when I was at NIJ when I first started there called Post-Conviction DNA Testing, where the federal government provides grants to uh, states to do, um, to do DNA testing on potentially wrongfully convicted uh, uh, persons. So, I, you know, one of the things that I, I learned is that, you know, that when I first got into this in 2009, I had I I really didn't have any idea uh, about you know wrongful convictions, and then I started I went to I went to an innocence project conference, and I sat in the back and uh, I'm not you know I'm not a really an emotional guy, and I'm sitting in the back listening to this person talk about how they spent 32 years in prison and they were found not you know or and they and they were you know proven to be. They actually found the true perpetrator in this particular case. I mean, I was getting choked up sitting in the back of the room. I'd never heard this. I never heard a story like that. And one thing that I say is that all forensic scientists should actually hear this story. Yeah. They should hear these kinds of stories um, just to a sort of appreciate it. And then also understand the implications, you know, if, if things go awry in the sciences, what can happen? I think it's important too. We had a case here in Texas that got national attention. I dropped it in the chat there. It's the Joe Bryan case that was actually a bloodstain case. Um, and interestingly enough, it was not actually an exoneration, unfortunately, um, but it was something that 
it, he did, uh, Joe Bryan was uh, convicted of the murder of his wife. And um, while it was never fully overturned, he was released on parole. Um, and, and we kind of see that a lot, right? When you fully overturn a conviction, there's a lot of monetary things that people on the government side don't want to do. So they're very slow to do that. Um, but interestingly, it, it wasn't DNA that brought them to this. It was actually current bloodstain practitioners who were brave enough to, to speak out against the injustices that had happened in that case. The bloodstain analyst that was allowed to testify in that case had completed a simple 40 hour course and had not worked any actual cases following that until this case um, and made very incorrect opinions and was allowed to present those because that was how it was done back then. Um, luckily, now we know that that is not what makes you an expert in bloodstain pattern analysis. And there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, and you know, in Texas here, we're very, very lucky to have the Texas Forensic Science Commission that helps us navigate that. Um, they don't have as much teeth as I would wish they would have, um, but we're working towards that. I mean, it is a huge step to just have that commission here in Texas and to have the, um, you know, that forensic science body as part of our, our court system to be able to, to look at those cases and weigh in. You know, Texas is one of the states where bite mark evidence is not allowed in um, because of the, the nature of it and um, generally overstating the opinions and really a lack of some of that empirical base for those things. So I think it's, um, you know, DNA is, is widely known for most of the exonerations and it's an amazing tool. Um, but it's also nice to see that there's practitioners that are willing to, to step forward and, you know, kind of put their neck out professionally uh, and kind of speak out against the, the injustices that have happened through forensic science over the years. I think there's so much value to that too, right? Because as we started this, there's not DNA in every case. Right. And so DNA, we can't all just be like, well, DNA's got it, right? Like no more, nobody will go to jail wrongfully anymore. And it becomes that really difficult process, like you said, Jerry, that DNA turned the spotlight. But now we realize, you know, how do we actually go about, you know, undoing a lot of the biases that we have, the assumptions that we have to do this really good case reflection to decide, have we actually put, you know, the right person in jail and how do we come and reflect on that. And I guess the same going back to this idea is being okay with the imperfection, right? Realizing that the imperfection doesn't mean that the whole sky is falling. It just means that we've gotten better at being more critical of ourselves. And that is always the goal um, in a kind way uh, to the students on the, on the call. Please don't be overly critical of yourself, but in a kind way. And just to add to what Dr. Goldfarb just uh, said, and so I, I saw a study not too long ago out of the UK and they surveyed uh, a number of cases that were worked and that I don't quote me on the exact statistics, but I'll, I'll tell you that it was a very low percentage. So it was, I think it was like 3% of all criminal cases involved DNA, only 3%. Um, so it, it, I may be wrong on the number, but I'll, I'll say that with some certainty, not hundred percent certainty, but with some certainty, uh, it was under 5%. It was, it's a very small percentage of cases that actually had DNA evidence. Um, so, so that, I mean, that's kind of a perfect point that, that Dr. Goldfarb makes is that we can't always rely on DNA evidence. And then also DNAs can be complicated as well too. It's not as easy as it sounds. You know, we're, I don't want to get into all the science of it now, but so we're, we're so much better at detecting small quantities of DNA but that can make things much more complicated. So I'm a chemist. And as I say, when we have technologies that can see much more, it creates lots of confusion to you. So sometimes you wanna see less because it's not, you don't have so much noise in there and the same thing with DNA. So now we have mixtures, we can detect mixtures very simply. Um, I give this example all the time. I could shake someone's hand and come and type on my computer and their DNA will be on my computer. And, and they've never touched my computer. So just something to think about. And we have to look at the largest number of cases. So let's take controlled substances. The, the fact that presumptive field testing is no longer really color metric presumptive field testing for drug analysis is not widely used like it was before. It used to be conclusive. People would get charged 
and without a forensic lab test, they would plead guilty. And it depends on what state you're in. You might serve jail time on a test that is nothing more than a functional analysis of what it may be. So that so if we look now, that's we're we're going to sophisticated field-based technology to do that because we have the technology that we can push forward. DNA is cool because it identifies people and we've done such a good job of selling it. But the majority of the other cases, toxicology and, and drug testing um, are the largest percentage of cases in forensic laboratories. Uh, I think fingerprints is probably right up there. And in cases in cities and states that have large firearms problems, firearms analysis is up there as well. So, so I think you have to look at those things and I will give a shout out to Texas because there have been other states to do commissions, but Texas is the model because they, I think they did it right. It didn't get it right early on. It took a while, but they got it right. And they, they have the right people, I think, on there for the right reason. And I think that's where we're gonna be going forward to help these conviction integrity units and all these other things are, we're gonna have standard policies and practices that everybody knows the rules of engagement for the forensic services they use. Amazing answers, honestly, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I think forensics has gone a really long way compared to before. Um, everyone made a good point with nothing is perfect. And just because nothing is perfect doesn't mean that it is not a learning experience because usually nine times out of 10, it's always good to learn from your failures. And this is, it's a really good example, not only in just forensics, but also in the justice system and other departments of the legal process as well. Um, usually we see that we kind of tend to point a lot of fingers at each other, usually one department taking the blame, other departments saying that it's your fault. So let's talk about how, what we can do and what we're doing to work better. What are your opinions on that? Mike, jump in, because you've been working on standards and seeing how we've been doing well, and I like to call you out, so. Yeah, I mean, especially in, in law enforcement, um, and quite interestingly, I've, I've worked quite a bit uh, due to my standards work as well with the Texas Forensic Science Commission. Um, and because of the, you know, forensics for me in, in my role, I don't work in a laboratory, I work for a police department. So I have um, folks that work in the field as well as do some laboratory examinations, um, very low level. But we sit at that very odd intersection of law enforcement and forensic science. While forensic science very much serves law enforcement and most labs are law enforcement labs, it's part of the justice system. It's not inherently a law enforcement thing, right? We're giving, uh, as a lab, we're providing facts towards uh, you know the matter at hand. Um, but interestingly, here in Texas, the Forensic Science Commission will never, um, we have licensing for our folks that work in labs and render uh, opinions based on their analysis. Um, they'll never license crime scene investigators. They see that as strictly law enforcement and it will fall under our um, uh, T call the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. Um, so that's one thing that I'm looking to pursue with within the state of Texas is getting us better, right? Currently, uh, to become a crime scene investigator, in all 50 states in this country, you only need a pulse. Um, there's no statutory requirement. However, all 50 states require a license to cut someone's hair. And here in Texas, you are required to have over 1,500 hours of training and practical experience to cut someone's hair. That dichotomy comes into play because traditionally law enforcement, so certified peace officers or licensed peace officers, were the ones conducting the scene analysis. Not that they really received that much training, but they at least have some requirement. Um, my hope is that we can, again, no matter how small of a requirement, make sure that there's a common standard so that we're all operating with the same base knowledge, skills, and understanding of the technology, understanding of our role in the justice system and making sure that we're doing things ethically to standards. Um, and it, it's not an easy task. Again, I've, I've said it before, Law enforcement is very much that this is the way we've always done it. Um, so we're gonna continue that way because it works, right? Why are we gonna change? Um, 
but there's, you know, the, the department I work for, I'm very lucky to work for a very progressive chief um, who gives great support to everything that we're doing here to improve and, you know, fully hold ourselves to be a best practice agency. Um, but I, I kind of see that as a, a challenge moving forward because there's a lot of agencies that don't really see that. Um, I, I think with the, the law enforcement, um, you know, the the relationship between the law enforcement and the community has obviously been very tenuous in the last couple of years. Um, and those departments that are forward leaning and really going back to understanding that we are part of the community, we have everything comes from the community, right? That's where we get our authority. We are part of the community. Um, and unfortunately, there was a period of time that it was very much an us first them, right? The, the police first, the community almost, right? Um, so really breaking away from that and making sure that we're doing everything responsibly uh, to to use all of our resources, especially the forensic sciences, uh, in a, a productive way. And it's not always just to to put somebody behind bars, but make sure that we're putting the right people behind bars. Um, and there's there's so many reasons behind that um, to make sure. Right, if we put the wrong person behind bars, it's quite simple. The, the true offender is going to continue reoffending, um, but unfortunately, some people are just want that culmination. They just want that end, um, even though it, it's not the right end. And I'll step off my soapbox. Um, do you have me thinking that people in Texas must have amazing hair? <laughs> That's a lot of hours of training. As, um, but yeah, I absolutely agree. Right, That's the idea of holding ourselves to standards is probably one of the first steps, right? The self-reflection in our own community um, to see that we are you know, doing a decent job and as lawyers being careful of how we talk about science um, and not overstating it. The other thing I would say is that creating incentive structures for people to work across the silos, um, making it so that you know, continuing legal education is offered when it's a forensic science event and then first you know, continuing legal education being certified for continuing forensic science training we don't do a good job thinking about how to incentivize people from other areas. This is a very, probably doesn't apply to you as students, but I promise when you become a professional, it will apply because you'll spend a lot of your life getting continuing education hours. Um, and so to the extent one day when you are in charge thinking about how do we incentivize across that boundary so that it's not just that we tell people to speak across the boundary, but we actually provide them with reason across that boundary, I think could go a long way. I just sent a link out on uh, a, a project that I was uh, that I oversaw on uh, what we did was we uh, looked at uh, the forensic science commissions that were established in 10 different states. Um, and now, although we couldn't say this in the report, I can tell you now because I'm retired from the government, is that the Texas Forensic Science Commission was really the model. It was the best, I'll say it was the best model. Um, it was so it was the, and one of the one of the things that we talk about in that report too is sort of the need for transparency um having an independent panel to review forensic science claim or uh, bad, potentially uh, a bad forensic science um, method that's been used so so the texas forensic science commission i, I i'm not going to say there's not a lot of politics to it because i think there's politics to all of these but not like in New York, New York has one. And I know there's a lot of politics with that potential commission, with that commission as well too. But um, Texas has a, has a pretty good, I think the way they've set it up and the bylaws that they've established are, are pretty solid. And, and I, I, I understand Michigan is the, the latest. And I don't know, Kevin, if you know for sure, but I believe so Michigan has set up a state forensic science commission. Um, I think it just happened in the past six six months to the, or the, in the past year, I'll say. I just spoke to the director of the Michigan State Police Laboratory yesterday. They're in the process of setting it up. And um, on the call was somebody who's very familiar with the Texas commission and they've modeled it pretty much directly after Texas. Um, making sure it, it, it's going to take a little time to work it out because in the beginning, Texas didn't have that many functional forensic scientists advising them. They had other people and they've worked out the details to get everybody lined up. So that's what's going on. I, I think the challenge is, once again, if we have 50 states 
we should have a model for the commission so that all 50 states work the same. For the lawyers on the panel, just so you know, the um, forensic laboratories set up a group for the lawyers that represent the laboratories for the first time ever. And that was very interesting to me. They, had a, they have the, the folks that are giving guidance to the laboratories on their cases and how they operate. And they're looking at practices and policies to make sure that it's transparent and clear exactly how they operate. And they look at the ethics side of it as well, Phyllis. So that's something you, we might want to look at at FIU is how do we partner with that, that group? Because I think we have a, for, for the students on, the, on this uh, webinar, you're very lucky to be at FIU. We have a very, very collaborative group of people around justice and forensic science. And we're progressive. Um, as you can tell just by this panel, we're not shy and we've got a lot of years of experience and that can benefit you as students. So please don't hesitate to ask any questions after this is over. Um, you know how to get a hold of us. We're, we're here for you because we as the preeminent program wanna make sure that we're given the best information we possibly can to our students. So you're successful in whatever you choose to do. Really, really great responses, as I said before. Um, I can definitely agree that FAU is, at least from my experience, and it's almost coming to an end, um, that FAU is probably one of the greatest institutions in South Florida, by far, with the projects, with the opportunities that it gives our students to participate in projects and research. Um, so I really suggest for the students that are in here to definitely look into the resources that FIU basically hands you and take advantage of it. I know that I still have not taken fully advantage of all the resources, um, but you should. Um, regarding the question, I think, or just all the answers, I think it's really good that we can basically come up with a system where like kevin said that all 50 states would adopt and make not only easier to communicate with different departments but also a lot simpler to basically not have all this confusion within and not have people who shouldn't be convicted be convicted and the people who should not be convicted. So I really hope everyone has joined, uh, not joined, enjoyed this um, webinar and this panel. I wanna thank everyone who has basically joined us and then the panelists who also joined us into this discussion. Please follow uh, not only APS uh, Instagram, if you have not, or, and also follow the uh, social media for FIU Forensics. If you have any questions or anything regarding um, departments or questions about the programs that, that is offered at FIU Forensics, just email them at forensics at FIU.edu. So I really hope you guys enjoy your night. Also, please listen to the podcast. I know I'm going to, because I love listening to podcasts. Um, I think it comes out, you mentioned November 29th? Yes, next Monday is the trailer, then there'll be the 22nd is the trailer, and the 29th are the first two episodes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the 29th, the podcast comes out, and if you guys are interested, uh, you can, I'll be sending out all the links through email and through chat. So good night, everyone. And I really hope you guys have a great rest of your week and a great upcoming weekend. Thank you. Everyone, thank you.